Sprung Cloud. Welcome everyone, all of you, the members of the Meetup Group, Winnipeg UFO Researchers and Experiencers Group, and to all those that are watching on YouTube, our YouTube page, Winnipeg UFO Researchers and Experiencers. Today is January 9th, 2024, and we are blessed this evening to have the executive producer, host of Veritas Radio, and who is also an independent journalist and entrepreneur. We welcome Mel Hasselrick. He's a good friend of mine. And Mel, thank you for coming. Thank you, Mark, for having me. And thank you for all these visitors. Do you mind if I call you Mel? No, not at all. A brother to a brother, of course. <laughs> does that does that remind you of something, Mel? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, let me, uh, Mel, I'd just like to start off by saying, um, and something for our, our, uh, our members here that are with us and listening to us in a future date on YouTube, hopefully, if we don't get taken down. But um, Mel, uh, one of the things I want people to understand and, uh, and make sure, uh, one second, allow the recording. Um, the one thing I want to say to you is that I know that uh, you don't do interviews typically, and um, I know that you have a very busy schedule in running Veritas. So uh, we thank you uh, greatly, and being a member for almost every year, I believe that you've been uh, running Veritas. Um, I know how busy you are because the stuff you produce is so fantastic. So thank you, Mel, for for being here. I'm honored. Thank you, Mark, and I've known you for 15, 16 years now since the inception of this program and. Honestly, you're a brother. I trust you. And this is why I accepted to be here with you today. I accept the trust with honor. Um, so, Mel, let's get into it because we've got a lot of interesting worlds we're going to go into. Um, so let me just get into my, I got my glasses on here. So uh, I want to make sure that I start off. So, Mel, let's, let's, let's start it with a little background on you because there are some people that may not know who you are, but uh, let's, let's do a little background on you and we'll get into Veritas after. Sure. Well, I was born and raised in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And ever since I was little, I always thought that I was somewhat different. I, you know, one day I was walking with my, my uh, grandmother and I said to her on my street, uh, they immigrated from a communist country, but I pointed out at a, uh, a house and I said, that house looks like your house back in the old country. And she started crying. And I said, why are you crying? And she said, because the house looks exactly like my house there. So fast forward a couple of years, I had my first crush in school. I came home, went to sleep. And at night I had a dream that said, oh, that girl that you like, she lives in such and such place. So almost like a mental GPS. So the next day, I came home and I told my mom, hey, I'm going to go up play. And I went, I walked for about two miles and I knocked on the lady's door. The lady opens up and said, son, why, why are you here? Well, I'm looking for so-and-so. And it was her. The, the daughter was there. Let me just bring my daughter to you. And I thought, I went, I said, hello and goodbye. So I went home running thinking, how in the world did that happen? I couldn't tell my parents. I was raised a Catholic. I was a, an altar boy. And if you say those things, they're going to probably bring a, a, a priest so they can do a, a what do you call it? That uh, Exorcism. Exorcism, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so anyway, then in the 1970s, the UFO wave, uh, Puerto Rico is one of the corners of the Bermuda Triangle. I've lived in two of them. The other one is in the middle of the ocean. But in the 70s, we saw a lot of sightings in Puerto Rico. And then one Saturday, one, one week, my dad says, hey, this week we're going to go to a farm. And I said, great. Saturday morning came along. He said, actually, we're not going anymore. And I saw him reading the newspaper. And on the cover of the newspaper, it said that there was a, uh, they used to call it, the, it's not the Chupacabra, but something similar. But anyway, at that same farm, they had a lot of cattle that, was, that were killed by this animal. So uh, you see all these animals in the United States, all these, you know, cattle mutilation, but that's exactly what happened. That was my first exposure to that. And I started looking into all sorts of UFO phenomena. So then I moved to Florida. And then in Florida in 1991, at 11 p.m. at night, always the alarm would go off every single night. And I would think that there's something wrong with it. So one night I just went running downstairs to see where 
the little light was being triggered. It was in my room. It's happened again. So the next day, I disconnected the cables from the alarm so I could go to sleep. That, that same night at 11 p.m., I heard a bing on the stairway railing of the, of the house. So I jumped from bed. I went and I touched it and it was vibrating. And I thought, wow, what's going on? Hurricane Andrew came along. I moved to Mexico City. Then I moved to an apartment. And then at 11 o'clock at night, I would get so cold. And I thought I had closed the windows. The windows were open. The curtains were flapping. And I said, no way. They're following me. The next day, I made sure that at 11 p.m. I closed that window again. Went to sleep. At 11 p.m., I felt cold again. The windows opened on their own again. So at that point, I was getting nervous. The alarm in Miami. Now it's Mexico City where I was, I was sent there for a mission to work. I went to the office the next day. At the end of the day, I was hiring people that day. And at the end of the day, there was a lady who looked like a, literally like a witch. And I hire her on the spot. I don't know why I felt a connection with her. And then after being hired, she said, sir, may I ask you, you seem a little bit distraught. And I thought, you know, I just hired you. Why would you be asking me a personal question? May I borrow your pen? I had a one blank pen, so I gave it to her. Just bring, it, bring it back to me in the morning. So she came back in the morning and said, sir, you have somebody who's trying to get in touch with you, but you're not letting that entity, I don't know what it is, a male, a female, but a spirit's trying to get, and I thought, how do you know this? Yeah, because at night you're getting these signals, but you're too close. You need to learn how to meditate. So anyway, almost a year went by, and Amalia and I became friends, and she, she would tell me all, so many stories. So one day she came crying to the office and said, I'm crying because you're leaving. I said, leaving? I'm enjoying my time here. Two days later, the Mexican peso had a collapse. My boss called me from San Francisco and said, we need to get you out. So I came to the office and she said, you get your phone call. Because she had told me, you're going to get a phone call in the next few days. You're going to be, you know, re transferred out of here. So she said, uh, you got your phone call, didn't you? So the day before I left, she came to the office. She gave me this little red pouch. I said, I want you to keep this with you in your wallet. Don't ever open it. You're going to lose the next of kin in the next year. I hadn't lost a relative at the time. You're going to marry somebody that looked exactly who's now my wife. That was years later. Eventually, you're going to move around the world, but eventually you're going to move to a place that's really warm, but it's beautiful in nature. But most importantly, your call, your duty will be to inform the world. And I said to her, wait a second. So I know we all going to die one day. So I'm going to lose somebody. Well, my father passed away six months later. Eventually, I married who's not my wife who looks exactly like how she described it. But explain to me, I'm going to inform the world? What do you mean by that? And she said, in due time, it will be revealed to you. This is 1993 or 94. Fast forward to 2008. Many things that happened in the middle, but I'm going to skip all that. In 2008, I had a dream that said, sometimes I get these dreams that have words. And it said, take action, take action. The next day I turn on the TV and I hardly ever watch TV ever, but I turn it on. And the first thing was this former military man, retired Milton Torres, who after 50 years of secrecy, the British Department of Defense, Ministry of Defense, had declassified the information. In 1957, this man was ordered to scroll his jet and shoot down a UFO over East Anglia, England, the size of an aircraft carrier. And that's all he said. Nobody would ask him the questions. And I would turn on, you know, just go channel surfing, BBC, Canada, the United States, and everybody would just ask him one question and that's it. And something told me, that's what I mean, take action. You need to find who this gentleman is so that you can interview him. So I found his telephone number. I went to dinner that night with my wife and I said, I need to be able to pretend that I'm a journalist that belongs to a platform. What, what name do you think I should use? And my wife, you ordered the words Veritas. Because Veritas can talk about anything. So the next day I called Milton Torres, who passed away, rest in peace. And I said, Dr. Torres, I am so, so from Veritas and I would like to interview you. He said, well, just tell me when. On December the 5th, 
I had my first recording, which was supposed to be just a recording between him and I, souvenir call. Saved it, uploaded it to a few forums out there. And in less than 24 hours, I had hundreds and hundreds of emails of people saying, when's the next show? And one of those emails was Stephen Bassett. You probably know who Stephen Bassett is. He came to me and said, hey, I heard that interview. When is the next one? And I would love, love to come on your show. And I was thinking, what show? What are you talking about? So I had to play the game. I created another interview. And the rest is history. Fairy Test has been on the air for 16 years. We started as a UFO podcast. And now we deal with every matter that, uh, that is important to the world, from child trafficking, health, uh, geopolitics, you name it, we cover it. So in a nutshell, I didn't want to sound repetitive, but that's, that's who I am. Well, that's not repetitive to many people that are here, and I, I appreciate you, you outlining that. Um, so you've already achieved, do you keep in touch with this woman that uh, was talking to you in Mexico City, or did you ever, did you lose touch with her? Or? Good question, good question. Because the moment I left, I left on a, on a Saturday, on Monday, I called the office to just talk more about what she, her predictions told me. And they told me, nope, she hasn't shown up. I called a month later and they said, the moment you left, she left. I called her at home. Her phone was disconnected. The office, they don't know where she went. She almost was there for a mission and she disappeared. I never once got in touch with her again. Oh, but about that red pouch. So about two years later, I had that red pouch in my pocket, in my uh, wallet. I was in that snowstorm in New York for a meeting. I went to, you know, put gas in the car. And I dropped my wallet. The next day, the police called me and said, by the way, sir, we found your wallet. So I went to the police station, got the wallet, no money. And the pouch was there, but it was open. So the first thing I had to do was throw it in the trash. Because she told me, if you ever open it, throw it in the trash. So I fly back to San Francisco. And my boss is waiting for me and said, your job has been eliminated. She said, if you open that bag, bad things are going to start happening. So a lot of <laughs> bad things started happening after that, but the bag was open. So anyway, that, that's what happened with the bag. And no, Amalia was her name. And no, I've never been able to get in touch with her again. Oh, I wish that would be something to, to have access to it. So on this, on this, pre, this platform that we're on right now, Mel, invite her to talk to you because she may watch this at some point and I at the feeling that she will, and hopefully she'll contact you again. Because uh, people that have those kind of gifts are incredibly important. Oh, I, I, I flew to Mexico City twice. I went oh, to where she you? lived, and they said, no, she, she, she left many years ago. <laughs> so even with the internet, I have tried many times. Because the question in my mind is, how did you know all of this? And she said a dozen other things about my past that nobody knew but me. So that's when you... From a believer, you become a knower because all the doubts I had in my mind in the past, if you told me, you know, there's people who can predict the future, there are time travelers, I would think you needed some medication. Now, because I've experienced all of the above, I can't discount anything. Well, such an interesting life, Mel. And uh, now that you have been the informer of the world of the truth, uh, you're one of the most incredible truth sayers. I'm not sure how many people in this uh, in this meeting tonight are aware of you, but uh, I'm sure that many of us have touched on it one time or another. Um, I, I just have to say that you've accomplished that goal, and uh, hopefully we can help you advance that and and become more aware by other people watching our show and actually uh, and actually joining up with Veritas. To be informed, and I got a little, I got a little thing that I would like to read about Veritas. This is from me, um, Veritas Radio. Uh, that's V E R I T A S R A D I O dot com. So that's the access to an incredible amount of information. Uh, I said it's it's uh, it's a incredible wealth of information for those with intriguing minds. Uh, inquiring minds and intriguing minds. Uh, Veritas is on, just on uh, season 16. 
Mel has put together Senatus, which is something we'll talk about tonight. Um, Unlock the Secrets of to Health and Longevity, which blew my mind when it came out. And we'll we'll talk about that more later tonight. So you've you've gone on to sort of the start of Veritas. And I think it's unfair for me to sort of say, so who's your favorite guest? Because I think that's that's not a I don't think that's a proper way to because they're all your favorite guests. They they've done you a favor and you know provided the information that they could to you and your listeners. But what I'd like to know is um who has delivered you uh, a message that actually um, maybe changed the way you were thinking and that basically had a tremendous effect on you and maybe even changed your position on uh, on on life from that perspective? Let's start well, with I have to say, Yeah, I have to say that it sounds cliche, but as you say, I don't have a favorite and not because I don't like some of the people. I love everybody that comes along. But it's because every single person that comes along every week when I interview somebody, that is the most important person to me in the world at that time. And every single person has given me something that has changed me. Every single one of them. And this is why I get people calling me saying, hey, I listened to this interview from 12 years ago and it changed my life. And they listened to it 12 years later. This is the beauty of, of technology. You know, we attack technology all the time. I do all the time. Now, especially our youth today suffering from, from mental uh, disease, a lot of it is because of, of technology, but technology is a, is, is a double-edged sword. You can cut an apple with a knife and you can hurt somebody with it, but same thing with technology, but I leverage it. And I love it when people say, hey, you saved my life. I was traveling. I didn't know where to go. And for an entire month, I was listening to all your shows. And now I feel so great. I've, I've found the light. You're going to listen to an individual. His name is Ryan Wardman. A few months ago, he told me his story and he traveled 40 countries in a matter of six months. And that interview is coming at the end of the month. A wonderful, incredible story. And I had to have him on Vox Populi. We have this spinoff of Veritas called Vox Populi for people who have never written a book, who have never been given a chance to tell their story. So they come to this platform and then... You know, many of them have written books. I mean, Chris Bledsoe was one of the first people that I had on Vox Populi. And I had other people, you know, former attorneys who are now best-selling authors. And their first interview, I'm honored to say, that was on Vox Populi because nobody gave them a chance. I don't know why. Um, but anyway, that's a, that's a cliche answer. Do I have a favorite? No. But one person I'm always thinking of, because she changed the way I think, Dr. Judy Wood. She's the author of Where Did the Towers Go? She's probably one of the most demonized people I have ever interviewed. She has been attacked from every angle. And, you know, when, when there's, there's more attacks, there's, there's more flack over the target. Her seminal book just helped me learn and, and make my own style of interviewing. Because in the past, I used to accept a lot of things as fact. But she had made me question, question reality question everything so it's not i'm saying i'm not saying she's my a favorite my favorite but she has taught me how to see life different and so have many other guests that i've had and right now i think we're approaching a thousand interviews yeah i know that's that's remarkable and that's that what is that what led you to the slogan you're talking about no and not believe Correct. Oh, that's something that I, that I carry with me ever since I was an altar boy when I was little. I don't want to believe I want to know because even at school, if I asked a question to the teacher that I wasn't satisfied with, I would be sent to this principal's office all the time. Like, oh, there's this problematic kid again. He's not satisfied. The answer is in the book. Well, I can't find the answer. I'm not satisfied with the answer. So it had to be when I was older in life to be able to do that. I really wanted to start doing this 10 years before, but my wife, this was after 9-11. And that was probably the thing that woke me up because I trusted, I trusted too much. I trusted her government. And then one of my relatives came to me once and said, hey, by the way, take a look at this PowerPoint presentation. Nothing crashed at the Pentagon. Can you believe that? And I said, how dare you? accuse our well-intentioned government of lying. How dare you? So I stopped talking to him for a few months, but in silence, I started looking into all of this. 
And I found out they lied to us. And ever since, that was my wake-up call. Like many people now, they email me saying, my wake-up call was when I watched your Corona Chronicles in the middle of COVID. That's when the whole censorship really started happening. We used to have a Vimeo channel only for our subscribers, a paid channel. And they immediately shut it down after the second Corona Chronicles. And during all that time, all the people who listen said, I was on the fence. Do I get the stinger? Do I not? And they listened to all that series, which I had to remove and only exclusive on our website, because even, even if I dare put that out there now, I'll get in a lot of trouble. So those are some stories of Veritas, uh, Mark. Yes. So the uh, you say you have stories that you aren't able to publish and put on Veritas? That's correct. And we talked about that before we started this podcast. Today. I see. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. I, the world is uh, an interesting place. One of the one of the things um, you had mentioned to me some time ago, we were having dinner at the All American Grill in uh, in Fountain Hills, not more than two miles away from where I'm at right now. And you'd mentioned something about pitchers, and you know, I've never followed up with you. I've never really talked about. It. Is it is there anything you can say on that front? These are pictures that you were at some point you received from somebody, and I don't know really know much about it, but I'll briefly discuss that. In fact, I think it was during that time or after. You remember Bob Dean, right? Yes, Bob Dean, good friend of mine. So he and I were one one of those conferences, and uh, he said, "Hey, I heard that you have some pictures." So I showed up to him, and his mouth dropped. And I remember there was I'm not going to mention the name. But it's one of those people that analyzes pictures. It's one of those professional skeptics. He sat next to us and totally debunked them. And <laughs> I, I could see Bob Dean. He wanted to hit him with his cane at the time. But I said, Bob, don't worry. There's going to be people who are going to say in the future, because this is probably in the, er in the early 2000s, um, there's going to be people in the future who are going to say, this is artificial intelligence. Well, we have artificial intelligence now. So... Anyway, I'm going to tell you a little bit of that story, which I cannot share too much about. I was in talks with another researcher. We were going to completely release this this year because it's been 16 years. In 2008 or nine, I was approached by somebody from Europe who had some images he wanted to show me. So he showed me the pictures via Skype and then trusted me and sent it to me. Fast forward a few years later, his friend, who was the star of this story, moved to, to the United States. So I'll tell you, in 1988, this individual living in Europe somewhere, at home, having dinner with his parents, all of a sudden sees lights flickering in his house, and the dog scratching the door to get out goes running into the field in Switzerland. I'm not going to give too many details. Okay, you know, I, I don't want this, these individuals to get in trouble. But the dog goes running. He goes following the dog. And he sees this cloud descending. But it was not a cloud. It was something metallic. It was, it was physical. He started throwing rocks at it. And he was hearing the, the metal. So it landed. And these light beings came out. And he started taking pictures. And he went inside the house and they came back, I believe, a year later. But this time they told him, we're coming back, have a camera, be ready. So in 1989, I believe, they started taking, he started taking pictures of these beings again. Lots of pictures, including one. I have to watch what I say because I released three of those pictures thinking that I could. But uh, I, I regret having done so. I, there's a video on YouTube that I had to remove that uh, had the season 16 premiere and I wanted to test the waters. But this individual called me saying, you are putting our lives in danger, so I had to remove them. Anyway, 1989, more pictures. And these beings said, we want to just show you what we can do. So he had his car and these beings dematerialized the car and have some of the images that show with the car in half. Incredible pictures. In 2010, this individual came to the United States to a conference to show those pictures in Arizona, I believe. And immediately after leaving that conference, 
He went home or to a hotel. He had over 10 people from the government knocking on his door. The literal men in black. And they said, give us all. They went inside. They opened every drawer. And they confiscated the original film. And they said, don't ever talk about this again. I met him about a, I would say probably about two years later in one of those conferences, maybe one of the conferences I saw you, Mark. And we met in a room and he told me, don't write down, don't write anything down, don't record anything. I'm just, I just wanted to meet you and let you know who I was. But these beings came back. I think it's 2010. He moved to the United States. And at that time, they said again, go to the store and buy a disposable camera because your digital camera won't work. Again, they showed him what, what it could do. These light beings showed him the moon and planets and incredible light formations inside of his home. Then one day after he's coming back from work, he hears laughter in his patio behind his house. And he said, I'm not expecting anybody. So he goes to the back of the house and there's this seven and a half, eight foot Nordic, beautiful female sitting there with an individual who's apparently behind all these lights, behind the person who sends all these lights. This is an individual from the future. He had a uniform and they said, don't take any pictures of us. So at one point he decides to go to the restroom. He grabs his cell phone without them knowing and he took a picture of the female Nordic from behind. And I have that image. It's like white hair. And then they went inside of the house and showed him more of the technology that they had. And on the mirror in the living room, you could see the image of the, 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 the male one who's from the future. Apparently he is from the United States and works for military and law enforcement hundreds of years in the future. And what he said was, we are in the middle of a time bubble here in, in, in planet Earth. And that time bubble will be released in the future. I have a book. I have all the information that they provided to me. I'm just trying to recollect a lot of it. And I have to be very careful about what I say because they literally said to me, they will nail us to the wall. They will kill us and our families if you release these images. But years ago, I communicated with one of them, the one, the subject of, of the matter. And he said, you can do whatever you want with them. I will deny everything because I've been persecuted by all the triple letter agencies. I'm done with that. So I thought that was implied green light for me to release it. And I was not going to na name his name. But after I released those three images temporarily on YouTube, the friend who took those pictures, who sent them to me, was the one who said, if you leave that there, I don't know what will happen with us. So please remove them. And I had to. But my plan was in 2024 to release all the images and the whole story to the world, because this is really part of disclosure. And before we started this interview, you said to me that a lot of your mindset about UFOs has changed. If I told you how much mine has changed, you won't believe where it's taken me. And I'll let you deal, lead this interview and I'll tell you later where I think this is going. Well, let's, I'd like to back up a bit because I'm interviewing you and I want you to tell us because uh, this is like at, when Veritas, I know you allow your, your guests to, to, and, you know, no disrespect to a couple other people that, that I've, I've watched over in my future where they basically like to dominate over the, the guests and you can't, you know, you want them to finish their sentence and they get interrupted. What I would like you to do is because of the importance and the time that we're in and the role that you are here to play, and obviously all the things you've already told us today has led to this moment where you're able, you've come on for some reason to our show, Let's get into that. Let's get into what your thoughts are on this, because this is why we wanted you here. Because I've been, um, I've been a, um, a subscriber to you, wanting to know what you think, and you rarely even broach that subject. Tonight we want to broach it. So let's get into it. What are your thoughts? That's fine. Well, my thoughts. First, let me go back to the 1970s. It was a commercial being filmed in Puerto Rico in the tallest building, and the the company the 
publicity company left a camera there. In those days, they would leave a camera filming all night, and then the commercial would be about, what, 15 seconds, and you could see the entire night and see the stars and the moon. Well, they capture a UFO, and they capture a UFO going from left to right and just turn on a dime. And in the 1970s, I was probably about what, seven, eight years old, and I was asking the questions like, what was that? Oh, no, that was just a star or a shooting star. Well, shooting stars don't turn left and then turn left and then right. That's impossible. And then the, the police company did say, yes, we were filming that commercial. And that became one of the most famous UFO sightings in the 1970s. And that just kept me going and going and going. So this is why I started Veritas, just to, to get more into, you know, Milton Torres, what he went through, how secrecy, you know, for 50 years, the man had to remain silent. They told him, if you open your mouth, you're going to lose your wife, you're going to lose your kids, and you're going to lose your wings. And he was a pilot. So he cried because he said, I couldn't even tell my father. I couldn't tell my, you know, a lot of my relatives who told me, you saw something, what is it? I can't tell you. So I have to respect a lot of these military men and women out there that swerve secrecy and they just can't talk about it. Imagine living with the, with the lie or, or, but anyway, let me just evolve, evolve a little bit on what I'm trying to tell you. So I thought this was all extraterrestrials. The more I look into the subject, the more I look into interdimensional beings. And even I had a cousin growing up, he worked for NASA. He was a, a uh, aerospace engineer. And we had this very deep conversation. I was probably about 12 years old. And I said, do you believe in extraterrestrials? And he was a very uh, nuts and bolts kind of guy. And he said, no, I don't. And besides, if there was a living being living somewhere, Proxima Centauri would be the closest star. And in order for them to come here with, with, the speed of light, they will be plastered on the wall of the ship. So no, I don't believe that. So those words always kept in my mind. He's only thinking of conventional wisdom, what school, academia showed him. But what about all the technology that might be out there that we're not even aware of? So I believe a lot of these beings are interdimensional. And also, if you look at our own oceans, 80% undiscovered, untouched, unseen, and we've seen, again, I'm going to go back to Puerto Rico, all the fishermen I've talked to through the years who say, I see these lights going, you know, from the sky and just going to the ocean and there's not even a splash or a sound. So in many places around the world, you see all these light beings living there. So what if they have been here forever, for millennia? And we call them extraterrestrials. There's so many places on this planet that are unexplored. What if they have been here and they're hiding from us? And when we ask them if we ever, if somebody's abducted and they ask the question, where do you come from? If you know, Mark, about earthlings right now, would you give them your address? I wouldn't. <laughs> so why don't I say I come from Santa Reticuli or from this other galaxy far, far away, when in fact they could be our neighbors under our feet underground or under the oceans and they just keep the technology and everything else secret. And our government and them are working in tandem to keep this the biggest secret in the world. It's, it's unbelievable that I might have been 20 years ago plus that, uh, you know, I used to listen to the, uh, the diatab of uh, that humans are the only living beings in the entire universe with a billion suns. And you know, I always believed in UFOs for whatever reason. I don't know why, but, uh, and, you know, I, I, I look at this and say, we've got to be either the most ignorant uh, beings in, in this universe where we are so arrogant that we think we're the only beings. It, my thought and from the people that we've talked to and the people that I talk behind the scenes with and the, and the hybrids that I've met at UFO Congress, what I've actually had discussions with, um, they were here well before us. So it's not like we're they're invading our space. We've been part of them, and they may even have created us from from uh, uh, in some form. I don't I don't know that for certain, but I just get to see well, you know the what the science and the history we've been told uh, 
religion, a number of different things that mo a lot of our people have lost connection with, uh, especially science in the last few years where I, you know, I used to have some respect for them and it, it just seems to have just fallen off the table. We're here today to sort of talk amongst people that are open-minded. On your website, you, um, I, I put this down, um, you, you, uh, Veritas state that is committed to discovering the truth and understanding reality as accurately as possible. This involves questioning and researching to uncover facts, as well as being open to new ideas and perspectives. It also constantly changing our beliefs and striving to gain a deeper understanding of the world. That is quite a statement because no one else is saying that out in this world right now, Mel, and you have, uh, and you've had, your guests have come on board. And even on our show, we've had the same. Um, the truth is something we're very unfamiliar with. The disinformation in this world is out of this world. I, I just, I, I look at this world that we're in, we'll talk a little bit about this later. The craziness that's going on in our world, you know, is when people start telling me men can have babies. And these are all distractions. They can't be real. And there's a reason for it. And uh, there's some things that I can't talk about as well. Uh, one of them is a, a very, very good friend of mine that um, talked about working in, in uh, underground bases and stuff like that. Um, they're real. This is a very trustable guy, very well-connected, intelligent kind of person uh, that... You know, I that I had difficulty understanding it. Then there's uh, issues of flat Earth. I've heard people talk about this, and it's one issue I I typically stay away from because like my thought process goes into if it is flat, so be it. If it isn't, okay, we're existing in this plane and this we're having this experience. It's for us to have. So, Mel, this is uh, this is an interesting world. It's an interesting time to be alive and actually to be able to find that. So well, let me unpack a, a few things you said, if you don't mind. By the yeah. way, I'm seeing the, the, the pop-ups here on, on Zoom of people asking questions. One person just asked, uh, and I wanted to discuss this later, about what happened in Bayside at the mall in Miami. I'm very familiar with that mall. I lived there. I know that mall from every inch of that mall. So I'd like to discuss that event uh, for what I've been gathering the past few days, which is a lot of information, a lot of this info also. Somebody asked if I know Anthony Sanchez. I know him very well. And some other questions. But you mentioned something interesting about science. I put this title on the last interview I did with Dr. Andrew Kaufman, who's a, a hero. For anybody who was following during COVID, he's great. But the title I gave to our interview was, If You Cannot Question Science, It's Secular Dogma, Propaganda, and a Cult. Period. Anybody who says, trust the science or hear the words for the greater good, run. And I feel bad for my friends, my brothers and sisters in, in Canada with uh, Justin Castro Doe there because what's yeah. happening in that country is is exactly what happened to my parents country and i don't want it to happen to my brothers and sisters and you live there mark yes i do yes i do and and we have uh, uh a lot of my fellow citizens are asleep canadians are a kind gentler sort of kind of people uh not gentler than other people but they're they're um, to actually point the finger at somebody and, and uh, ridicule them is not something um, that is every day. But also the other, I don't know one Canadian that wants to go out and kill anybody. Um, a lot of that's changing right now because uh, the things that we start looking at, we're going to need to start defending ourselves from these kind of people. Trudeau is running a totalitarian government. And I actually met with Pierre Paul Hervé, who is the uh, leader of the opposition right now and probably going to be our next prime minister. And uh, I went to a fundraiser of his when he was in Winnipeg, and he told me that uh, we're we're being captured and have been captured by people that are of the left. And obviously in Canada, we have, I think, seven, five or seven uh, Chinese police stations, essentially places where they hunt down people from China that are dissidents that have been against the Chinese government. Uh, how we allowed that in, in Canada it only goes to me that we're either under total control by them or the people that are running our country are. And quite frankly, Trudeau has already expressed his interest and in how, how wonderful he thinks the Chinese are. Well, um, we have a country, a very free country, and we have many, many, many millions of people have died fighting for freedom, true freedom. 
And I think it's a great disrespect that we do by not standing up for freedom at this time, because those people, very young and old, have put their lives on the line, and many have died to defend it. I don't see any reason why we're going to stand back and let this happen. And many of my Canadian friends that I talk to quite often, we're getting very upset by what's going on. Many mil military people that are retired, policemen, those kind of things. All these people behind the scenes are getting very angry with what's going on. But I don't want to get too political with this world because the, we're on a topic here that is one of the most interesting topics unknown to mankind. The thing you just talked about. So what can you tell what more can you tell me about miami because that was an interesting thing that caught a lot of people's eyes and I, i'm wondering why they even let it out in the first part but uh how, how what more do you know about that before we go there if, if you don't mind let me just address quickly about what's happening here in the united states too, not only canada but here i mentioned to you that i have business in mexico and i use a certain border here in lookville which was closed for 30 days the entire town was shut down completely. And I had somebody I know, Jeff Rainworth, Rain, Rainforth, who is an a independent journal, journalist who stayed there 24-7 at night filming in the border at night when all the federal employees were gone. Thousands, thousands were coming at night. They cut one of the beams in this border and thousands of people were coming at night and they're all coming from Central America or South America. These are people coming from all over the world, from Africa, from the Middle East. They're coming to through Turkey and they're coming to Mexico and in buses and they're, they have new clothes, new tennis shoes. The moment they step on us soil, they get a debit card, $5,000. They get a new cell phone and they get an online ticket to go somewhere else. I started digging into this and I wrote a blog article about it. Anybody can read it where, it's a new red dawn, what's happening here in the middle of the night. These thousands of people are coming. And I suspected that it was because we don't have the quota for our military recruitment. I have a friend who told me that last July, he had dinner at a friend's house in, in, friend's house in Utah. And General Mattis, the former Secretary of Defense, was there and said 70% of all new recruits cannot pass the physical or mental exam. And then Senator Dick Durbin here in Colorado said that we need to give all these people citizenship so that they can, they can join the military. It seems that we're going to be going to war. The military industrial complex and the, the big pharma are the two. During COVID, one industry was, was making billions of dollars. Now it's the turn of the military industrial complex. But all falls into one realm, the population. And people need to be more aware about this before you agree to anything, question the authority. But let me go back now to, before I forget about what happened on January 1st, Bayside. I know that mall very well. It's not a mall, the usual malls that you go inside, it's all air conditioned. This is kind of an outside mall. So the story is that some teenager, teenager had sticks and fireworks in the history of the world. When have you seen at least I counted over 75 patrol police cars there? I was told it's over hundred. The entire Dade County, Miami Police Department, and even some state troopers were deployed to that area immediately. What I'm told is some teenagers had what looked to be like a DVD player. Let's call it technology, right? And they got together and they turned that thing on. When they turned it on, almost like a field around them, it looked like almost like a, I kind of try to, to articulate this the best I can, but it was almost like a, a glitch in the matrix, a circle, almost like a stargate opened up. And all of a sudden, these beings, about eight to 10 feet tall, started coming out their heads, their foot, and they got out. And there's even a video out there showing one of these beings walking outside of the mall. And you can see them. They're over 10 feet tall. Um, they didn't seem to be threatening, but obviously a lot of people got scared. And some people who, were, who had guns with them, they started shooting at them. But they were not physical, but they looked physical, almost like a hologram. So the question is, could this be a distraction from the Epstein files? Possibly. Could it be? that they use this technology to, to open, uh, I mean, look at what's happening in CERN. CERN is not what you're thinking. 
I mean, in a bankrupt world, how do they have billions of dollars to run that in the middle of Switzerland? So these things came out. And what I've been told, they look scared. They look like, it's almost like if you and I are walking here on, in the United States, and all of a sudden we appear in another world. And then you see beings that look like mushrooms looking at us. We're going to feel out of place. You know, what's going on here? And they're going to feel threatened about us. So this is what I've been told. Apparently, a lot of the people were cordoned off, and the police took everybody's cell phone to delete any video or pictures that everybody had. This is why we don't have that much footage of the event. Lights went out in that part of the, in, in that area completely. The I'm told that the airspace was closed. No flights were allowed for a couple of hours from Miami. And as you know, it's a very busy airport. Only a helicopter, unmarked helicopter, was running around the area. So could it be a distraction? Maybe. But what tells me that it was not was the number of police cars that I saw. And the last time I saw that many police cars, I got to tell you, it was a couple of years ago during the you remember in Miami Beach a couple of years ago, there was a, a, a building that collapsed? Well, I had yes. schoolmates that were in that building and they passed away. So I went there during the search and rescue. And I found, I talked to a couple of, of people from Mexico that made it there because there's experts, you know, in the earthquakes in Mexico, they're experts. So they were sent to Miami, but they were not allowed to, 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 to engage in the search and rescue. And the one thing that I found critical was that they, had debris being taken to the port of Miami, escorted by police, and I followed them for hours. And the question is, what did they have in that building that was so important that all the debris was taken out? That's a crime scene. They were all taken out to the port of Miami, almost like what happened in 9-11. So that's my take on, on the uh, Miami issue. It could be inter interdimensional beings that... Uh, you know, blurred into our reality momentarily. But all these kids supposedly had the technology that turned it on that allowed this to happen. Why now? Why are they trying to distract us from? And I don't think this is going to be the first time. I mean, we're, I'm hearing from people in, in Brazil that are seeing giants walk in the mountains. My, tomorrow, I'm not going to name the name, but I have somebody, it's an investigator who has one of the most important stories of our lifetime right now. What's happening in Peru? I don't know if you've heard about the Belacaras. Belacaras. Are these beings that are alien down there, they have technology? Let's not call them extraterrestrials. I don't know if you heard the name Michael Herrera. It's one of, he's one of the new witnesses in the Disclosure Project. Well, I yes. interviewed Eric Hecker a few weeks ago. The interview is coming out in a couple of weeks. But also I'm in the works with Michael Herrera to do an interview. And this is where all my... Clarity about UFOs is changing. He said that in 2004, I believe, during the Banda Aceh tsunami, Marines, he was with the Marines, he was sent there in one of those the, the places, um, and he saw a flying disc, and they were loading it with, these were Americans, they were loading it with a lot of stuff, including children. So it makes me wonder with what's happening in in. Peru, by the way, one of those girls down there, one of the witnesses was attacked by some of these beings. What if these people that are in charge of powers that want to be, adrenochrome, that's a word I don't like to use because it's very censored. What if these people had the technology from many years ago? When we think of Tartaria, when we think of, of the megalithic structures around the world and, and they say, oh, it's ancient aliens, those were aliens. What if it was us? What if we all perish today and in a hundred years they uncover iPhones and computers? They might say, well, aliens must have been here in the past. No, it was us a thousand years ago, a million years ago, a billion years ago. I think we've been here longer than we're led to believe. They say that we evolved from apes. So why do we still have apes? Anyway, I don't want to confuse the whole thing, but I think that a lot of these people, the worst of the worst, all these underground caverns and, and cities that Phil Schneider used to talk about all the time, and this is probably why he was killed, is because the elites, I mean, look at uh, Zuckerberg, look at uh, Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos, they're all building their bunkers, they're expecting something to happen. 
Yes. But the technology is there for them to use adrenochrome, which I believe is a billion dollars a kilo. So when you think of that, think about everything else they might be using, all the child trafficking. That is the worst of the worst. And, and, and when I started looking into this, it was, it was more like a roadkill. When I interviewed Nick Bryant about the, the child trafficking and, and how honeypots are used in all governments around the world, I didn't want to listen to it. People would tell me that is one interview that I decide I don't want to listen to. But then a few years ago with Jeffrey Epstein, then people started listening to it again. And it was all of a sudden vogue. Now everybody's talking about it. And the, the film, uh, what's the name of the film? Uh, the Son of Silence. For, Son of Freedom. So, yeah. Then all of a sudden people are talking about this. So why now? Is it because they're normalizing pedophilia? Is it because they think if we don't talk about it, then it's going to go away? Anyway, I don't want to mix all these subjects together, but this is how my mind works. It jumps yes. from one topic to the other. Well, you you know, when you start talking about this stuff, um, I don't know one human being that I know that finds that acceptable. I mean, maybe they're, you know, they wouldn't talk in open discussion at any time. Changing the word from pedophilia to loving younger gender or you know, the type, whatever words they want to change it to. Pedophilia is pedophilia. And uh, minor attracted individual. In I'm minor sorry? attracted individual. That's the term yeah. they want to use. Yeah, which to me is it's not acceptable to any rational human being that I know. So we can I, I recognize that we're we're uh, we're jumping around a bit, but going back to um so I I've I've uh, I talked to Carol, Dr. Carol Rosen when she was speaking in Phoenix here at, at a MUFON meeting. And we went out for dinner after, and we had quite a conversation. And we went back to uh, the uh, the leader's uh, home, and we had a fireplace outside, and we were talking. And she went through her issues that she continually talks about, you know. The, and then the final the final move is uh, the false inv alien invasion. And I'm I'm concerned because they've actually reached all their goals that they she talked about. So it, it this chain of events continues. Uh, maybe Nazism, maybe whatever, whatever it actually is. Um, I'm concerned that they'll use alien, fake alien uh, uh, invasion through holograms and that sort of thing, because obviously holograms have become a real thing uh, and known to the the, the masses. But um, any, so did you interviewed uh, Carol Rosen, right, Dr. Carol Rosen? She's a good friend of mine. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, so, many times. As, have you talked to her recently? Is she still on this this bandwagon? No, inter, you know, no space weapons and that sort of thing. Because obviously, I think we do have space weapons after watching Hawaii and what happened there. <laughs> That's another story. Oh gosh, do you want me to go there? I mean, yeah, no, I have not, not talked to Carol. Last time Carol and I talked, remember when the congresswoman was shot here in Tucson? Yes. So I was on the phone with her, and then my wife called me saying what happened. My wife was having breakfast across the street with our, with our daughter when the whole thing was happening. And uh, that's another story that what happened here in Tucson. Uh, a judge was, was uh, killed. And uh, I read the death certificate that said blunt force trauma to the head when in fact he was shot in the, in the stomach. That's a weird story what happened here. That's for another time. Um, but Carol, what she said, what uh, Von Brown told her first, it's going to be the the, the communist, then it's going to be the terrorist, then it's going to be a celestial object, and then there's going to be the last card. The last card, don't believe it. It's going to be the alien invasion. Do we have the technology to fool the people? We've had it since the 1950s. They were going to use it in Cuba to tell all the Cuban Catholics that Fidel was the devil, but they never used it. After Kennedy was killed, that was just wiped out. But, uh, you know, that information is out there. Somebody's asking me here if I might, before I forget, I saw the words, Dr. Uh, Paul Benowitz, I have letters. Uh, the, the, years ago, I get a call from here in, in, in Arizona. Hey, Mel, there's this couple. Uh, the husband died, the wife, the wife is dying, and they want to be able to, to sell all their collection of, of UFO books to somebody, and I think you'll be the right person. I thought maybe 20 books, right? I thought I'll buy them all. When I get to their house, we're talking about almost pallets, Pallets of books and newspaper clippings from the 1960s all the way to the 80s and 90s. We're talking about books that 
from the 1950s, 60s, shine autograph. Some of them, they had three copies of them. So I have tons of, of books in storage. But in one of those envelopes, it was letters from Dr. Paul Benowitz. They had tons and tons of letters from people. But basically, at the, in the 1970s and 80s, people used to write to each other. You know, you write to me, a week later you receive the letter, then you write to me again. It was beautiful. And that's how Dr. Paul Benowitz was. And they made him look like he was crazy. And I think that they, either they killed him or he committed suicide. Very similar to what happened to Admiral Byrd, what happened to the first Secretary of Defense. Um, what was his name? For Forrester. Forrester. Uh, he jumped from a, 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 a third floor in the hospital. So this happens to a lot of people. But anyway, you know, I just wanted to say I do have that information for Paul Benowitz, and I believe it's on a website. Any of our subscribers can read it there and, you know, a lot of other stuff. I have CIA and FBI files for Tesla and, uh, and Einstein, Von Braun, and the rest of them. So anyway, I forgot what I was saying, Mark. So go ahead. We, um, we were talking about uh, Carol Rosen and the, these issues, but um, as we were talking, we we're going to go into Hawaii. And, oh, Hawaii. Uh, yes, yes. I have space. something to tell you about Hawaii. I've been following that story from day one, and I have people on, 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 on the island, and it, this is just an incredible story, and I feel so bad for the residents of, of Maui, not only because of the loss of, of people, uh, but the, the, the interesting things and the what I call almost paranormal. If anybody had a blue roof, your home survived. If you look at the Oprah's home mansion, blue roofs survived. And this individual who filmed after, you know, we, they were kicked out. They wanted to remove all the evidence. But he went to what used to be the chart house, one of the restaurants there. And there were two umbrellas that survived. The whole restaurant is dustified, ashes. But the two umbrellas are blue and they're standing right there. Another scene has probably about seven vehicles, all burned, like what we saw on 9-11, and all these oh, burned cars. Aluminum tire smell. Exactly, exactly. And the only car surviving in that group was a car painted blue. So something with this, whatever technology is, let's call it a directed energy weapon, a laser, it's, it's done in a way where the color blue is not affected by it. But here's the kicker also. Somebody sent me a picture of a military base in Maui where you could see dozens of school buses. And the question is, over 2,000 children up to this day are missing, but not a single parent, a father, a mother. I mean, if we lost a child in a fire like this, you and you survived, believe me, we will be screaming that somebody in the moon would hear us. Not a single parent is coming out. What happened to those children? And what I'm told is they didn't even make it to school. They stayed home. And apparently those buses took them somewhere. Perhaps, and I'm not saying this is true, but why are those buses in a military base? Did, 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 did those children make it to that base? And now they're taking all those ashes and put it in the tap water. But one thing people are not following too is what happened in Acapulco weeks after. Do you know what happened in Acapulco a few weeks ago? A, a an incredible hurricane? A hurricane. It was a tropical storm, not even a Category 1. At 6 o'clock, everybody said, oh, it's just a tropical storm, not even Category 1. At 1 o'clock in the morning, it had turned to Category 5. That does not happen in nature. And everybody right. said the same thing. We did not see a drop of water. All the water that came in came from the ocean. And if you look at the images I saw of all of Acapulco destroyed completely and the military checkpoints at the entrance of Acapulco allowing people to leave, but nobody could go back to Acapulco. So the question is, what are they trying to do? I know there are weather wars. I know they have weather modification technology. But if anybody owns property in the coast, watch it. People in California, people in Mexico, and I, I'm one of those. So... What are they trying to hide? What are they trying to do? And it seems to me the west of the Mississippi is going to be an interesting part for the elites. I'm not talking about just California, west of Colorado. Colorado 
seems to be the next capital of the United States, Andrew Bashago. You know who Andrew Bashago is, right? Yes. Sorry, well, allegedly, time travel. time travel, exactly. He said that he saw Washington underwater and the new capital will be Colorado. And if you have been to the Colorado airport, you've seen so strange paintings. But there are underground cities all the way going to California, Mexico, and even in the Pacific Ocean. So what is Maui? What is Hawaii? Apparently, and New Zealand also. Very famous people, wealthy people are moving to those areas of the world. What are they expecting? And if you have read, and I have this book on my website on the library, the Adam, Adam and Eve story written by Chan Thomas, former CIA, wrote a book about how we're entering the fifth or sixth reset. And that book came out in the 1950s, if I'm not mistaken. The CIA confiscated it and removed about 70% of the book and then re released it. I have both versions of the, of the book on my website as well. So anyway, I don't mean to digress. Yeah, not a problem. Also, the blue from Hawaii is the UN blue, which is kind of eerie at Correct. this point. Um, one other thing I want to go back and touch on just for a second, because I don't want to spend too much time on it, but the idea of these people that are coming into the United States, uh, I've watched many, uh, many, let's say over an hour of, of vintage, uh, video in when I take in totalitarian of all the videos I've watched through many different days. And I, what I'm seeing is mid-20s, br military brush cut type of young uh, people coming into the country. Now, how do we know that these people aren't military from Venezuela, from other countries that are not friends of the United States? And so this is something that where you start talking about uh, black swans, which I'm not sure people even understand what black swans are, but um, these are these are like 9-11, um, you know, m many those things that we unforse very unforeseen, un improbable type of things happening. So these people are all embedding themselves all around and cause could cause uh, I'm not trying to be a fear monger. I'm just trying to I'm trying to speculate why you would leave your border wide open. It just doesn't there's something that just doesn't make any sense at all to me. But anyways, well, we have 2024 is going to be an election year in many parts of the world here. We have elections. I don't know if in Canada, but here in the United States and Mexico. Oh. And these people are 99 percent from the ages of 18 to 45 or 35. Actually, that's military age men. Most of them don't speak English. Most of them really do not really like the United States. If you look at some of the countries where they're coming from, you know, many of them are coming from China. How do we know? How do we know that China is not, and this is already happening. China has positioned them in many places here from the top of the government to the lowest. As you mentioned in Canada, where you have police stations. We also have them here in the United States. I'm not going to name, name the locations, but they're all over Africa as well. They're taking all the rare earth minerals, here in the United States, we have UN buildings where people, reporters are trying to get in and they say, nope, get out. This is international territory of the United Nations. You're not allowed to, to exert your First Amendment rights here in, in, in the United States. So all these right. people, are they, the question is, years ago, Janet Napolitano, you might remember this, but the Department of Homeland Security purchased billions of hollow point bullets, military equipment. You probably have heard of the Walmarts, Walmarts and the Home Depots will be the places if the excrement hits the fan, those will be the first places to be activated. And many of them they have closed. People have gone inside and they have seen some of the things that they have inside. But are these people going to receive those weapons and those bullets? Are they going to use them against us? Because I've been told by our own military. I know people in the military who say we will never, never point a gun to a fellow American, never. And the only way they're going to do this is they, they bring people, for people from other parts of the world who have no liaison or no attachment to the United States and they're promised a better life, food, and a citizenship. They will do it, no problem. So the question is, are they going to be conscripted, conscripted into the next world war or are they going to be used here in the event China decides to invade? We have porous, porous borders in Canada and in the southern border. So it's only a matter of time. And I hate to say this, but my fellow Americans are asleep. The majority of the people are asleep and they're not asking questions. Why are those people coming in droves, thousands and thousands, and they're appearing in New York, in Chicago, in Texas? Why? 
Nobody's asking the question. While our veterans suffer, they can't go to the, the hospital because all these people are being given priority. I go to the airport all the time. I see them at the airport. Let's say I, I have a non-first class ticket, priority number four. No, but all these people have priority number one. They access the plane faster than anybody else. They go through customs before anybody else. Why the preferential treatment? Something is happening. Are they going to be given voting cards or, or, or they're going to be able to vote in the next election? I don't know, but somebody is trying to hold on to power. And I don't want to get political here, but I, I do have to say that I hate communism. My family, two generations from Spain and Cuba, suffered socialism and communism. And this is what I see happening in this part of the world, in Canada, in the United States, and Mexico. When we talk about the Amero, remember the American Union? The Amero, yes. this might be the time when this might happen in the near future if this continues. So I hope this, not, this does not become a civil war or it becomes kinetic. But if we don't do something about it, come next November, if we lose again, I have no, there's nowhere else to go. My father, rest in peace, always told me, always preserve your democracy. This is a constitutional republic. We were lucky to escape to, to the United States. Preserve this because if you don't fight for it, you won't have anywhere else to go to. And this is a question I get all the time from people. Mel, where should I go? Nowhere. You need to stay here with me and fight if we have to. Obviously, the uh, the universe is guiding us to where we need to be today. And this discussion, I know a lot of people may be turned off by it, by only because it's something that's very difficult to absorb and, and to uh, believe even from that perspective. But um, I think from from this point, maybe maybe we can go back to, to Veritas, if you don't mind, Mel, and we can sort of go back into some of the other people. Like one of the things you talked about earlier, we we're talking about war. Uh, uh, portals and potential, like when they opened up the thing in Miami. Um, have you had guests that have talked about the stargates, wormholes, oh, yeah. portals? What what can what world can you take us to there that would give us a better understanding? Because that's how I believe people get from one star system to another. Mark, I love your questions because those are so relevant. And I discussed this a few days ago. Somebody asked me about this. But in 2011, I believe, or 2010, if you do a search on a website for William Henry and Stargates, this is 2011. I, it was on a weekend. And I'll, I get a, uh, an email from a, the guest I was going to be interviewing that following week saying, hey, I have a personal matter that I have to take care of. I won't be able to participate. And I said, oh, gosh, okay. This is Sunday. I decided to turn on the TV. And I started watching this show called Stargate Universe. And in the pilot episode, the ship and the, 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 all the members of the ship, they go and they see the sun and they say, we're going to crash into the sun. They thought they were going to die. They go through the sun and they appear somewhere else, basically telling us, telling us the sun is a stargate. And I thought that's really interesting. And in my mind, I thought, I know William Henry. I wonder what William Henry would say about this. Next morning, seven o'clock in the morning, I'm getting ready to send emails to people to replace this, this individual that I was supposed to interview. Without even me sending the first email, I get an email from William Henry who says, hey, Mel, I'd love to come on your show to discuss Stargates. So that's another synchronicity that happened to me as well. Stargates are all over the place. I'm told that what we saw in Iraq was really not uh, Saddam Hussein and the rest of them. They had ancient technology. Again, what we see now, ancient aliens telling us that the pyramids were built by, by extraterrestrials. I hate to use that term when it comes to all the things that we see in the past. I've interviewed members of the Dogon tribe who get mad, upset when we use that term. Oh, extraterrestrials, the pyramids. They were the priest caste in Egypt, and they had to escape when the, the, you know, the, the whole thing happened there. They had to escape to Mali, and now they... they transfer their knowledge via oral tradition. And they said, it was not extraterrestrials. It was us. It was human beings that live in that part of the world. You know, the Nanunnaki, the Nephilim, all that Babylonian in that part of the world. That's the cradle of civilization. And that happened all over the world. All these buildings that we see in California, in Cambodia, in Argentina, in Brazil. And we were supposed to believe that in the 1800s, when we had horse and buggies without any special tools, we were able to build these magnificent buildings. Same things with all these statues in, in Italy. 
You see the, these magnificent statues with a veil with so intricate. There's no way that you did not make a mistake. What if in that in the past they had technology, what we call 3D printing you know, machines? What if they had that? Uh, the stone, the stone that they used in those days hardened with time. With earthquakes, they're still standing. Now we build a house. You're a developer, Mark, you know. Right now, if we built something, it might last 100 years maybe. But all these places last, the, the older they are, the stronger they get. So do Stargates exist? Well, there's a place here in Arizona called, called uh, what's the name? Portal. Portal, Arizona. And I've been told that in the summer, and you, you spend time here, you know what monsoon time is, monsoon season. During monsoon time, when the weather enables this area, there's a cave in Portal, Arizona, that people have sent chickens inside only to disappear. They, 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 they wrap a wire around the chicken leg. The chicken walks in. All of a sudden, the, the wire is cut in, into half. So there are places in this world. Sedona is another place that, that, that's considered a portal. I have another story about Sedona. Uh, it was to me that a professor from California went to Sedona to investigate a special area that was emanating some kind of a signal. So he went there. All of a sudden, two individuals with black vests, overalls, with a insignia of an inverted pyramid, yellow, with automatic weapons. They said, sir, what are you doing here? Well, I'm investigating. I have a permit here from the city. Nope, sir, you're going to have to get out immediately. And we have, uh, we're authorized to use lethal, lethal force. So there are places around the world that you and I are not allowed to. And you mentioned the flat earth. I discussed that on my show. I'm a globe skeptic myself. I'm not a flat earther. But I also see all the NASA pictures. And I'm not convinced because none of those images shown to us by NASA are real. They're all CGI. Every time they show us once, you know, those images, the United States looks bigger than the time before, you would think that by now it would be the same. Then a few years ago, you had the epic, epic video of the moon going over the earth. And the moon looks tiny in comparison to the earth. And I think 1972, when the astronaut there, the first time we ever saw a picture of the blue marble, the blue marble seems tiny. If it's right. true what they're showing us, then the earth should be occupying the entire landscape. We wouldn't be able to see this guy in front of us if we, if the earth is the size of what it is. So, no, I don't believe NASA. I think Apollo was the $150 billion uh, hoax on the U.S. taxpayer. There's a, Mel, there's a, uh, and, and this is a strange subject for me to be talking about on the flat earth or flat earther, because I thought, you know, it's too easy to say, well, people say that's just too far from my reality to even believe. And I think I was there at one point. Uh, I watched a recent video, seven hours long, that talks about the different rings of the world, the existence of this plane, I guess right. what I would I would uh, describe it. And um, and this guy goes through this information, the reading, the information, and there's a map that this person has that he that he deciphers from. And it's quite interesting. Um, uh, the the also the issue of uh, uh, you know why why don't why can't you fly from New Zealand to uh, South South America? I was always wondering why do they always fly over uh, you know go through Alaska and stuff like that, which actually supports the flatter earth concept. So you think you'd be able to fly from New Zealand to South South America, like to Peru or something. There are no flights that fly there. But so, you don't even have to mention that. All you have to do is go back to 1959, I believe it was. 56 countries signed the United Nations Antarctic Treaty. And then a few months before that, NASA was established. Why is it? that they don't allow flights to go over Antarctica or the North Pole. Is it that they don't want us to see what's there? They always say, oh, because the instruments, the instruments of the plane might not work properly <laughs> and we don't want to cause any crashes. Uh, but w I've asked this question to many people and I can never get an answer that satisfies me. All right, so you have all these, these countries signing to this treaty. The Wright brothers in 1903 flew for the first time. Immediately after, what do we get? World War I, and then commercial commercial airliners. 
If we went to the moon in 1969, 1972, and we'd never been back again, at least we should have some low orbit hotels by now. And at the least, you and I could maybe, hey, maybe we need to talk about this, uh, but Jay Weiner tried and they shut him down. But why is it that I'm not going to give him credit for all these large companies? You would think they want to put their brands everywhere. They have their brands all over the place. You would think they would just find a rocket, go to the moon, and put a camera, look in at Earth, and call it Earth TV with Nike or Pepsi or Coca-Cola or whatever they are. But you think by now they would have a camera looking at Earth. I would subscribe. I would love to have a big screen TV looking at Earth, supposedly going around 24-7. That's not going to happen. Jay Weiner tried, tried it with an investor. He called a friend of NASA, and they said, if you even try, we're going to shut down your rocket the moment it leaves the, the, the Earth. So there you have it. Yeah. Um, we, I'm just going to... I'm just actually just panning through the questions right now to see what topics we haven't talked about. And um, there's uh, there's one, uh, does the essence of alien and alien civilizations affect religions on this earth, especially the mono, 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 monotheistic, monotheistic uh, like Christianity? I heard people from the top and have been inviting the religion leader religious leaders to, to the Antarctica discussion yeah so yeah, that what, are, is, what are your thoughts on that well that's very strange allegedly a few years ago important people the the orthodox the equivalent of the pope down there uh john Kerry, buzz aldrin went down there as well and said that what he saw was evil evil incarnate but we don't see any video we see nothing absolutely nothing when i started veritas I had a video with a bunch of images that allegedly were from a, a science fiction movie. But the images at the time, this is before AI, they look so real that it makes you wonder if those images were given to the people who, who had that uh, little mini movie. You, I forgot something project. I forgot what it was. But it had pictures of UFOs from, from the ocean. They had uh, pyramids in Antarctica and so many other things. So it really makes you wonder what they had there. But my question is, why haven't we commercialized that area? Admiral Byrd, if we believe him, this is a, an admiral who went there not once but twice, who was supposed to be there for, I believe it was six weeks, and came back two weeks later. There's information from the Chilean newspaper, El Mercurio, indicating that one of the vessels had to come back with a bunch of our military personnel uh, that was hurt. So something happened. They encountered something. Some people say they went out there to make sure that the Nazis were not there. Was it Nazis? Was it something else? But the story of the diary of Admiral Byrd is just absolutely incredible. Do I think yes. that something is out there? Yes. I think that at one point in our past, that area was tropical. And I think if you look at the, the clock in Prague in the Czech Republic, that clock has been there for, I believe, over 700 years has never been broken. And if you see it, that clock, it has the seasons. And when I say seasons, apparently the sun and the moon stay in this part of the world for some time. And then after, I don't know, maybe hundreds or thousands of years, it moves to another area of, let's call it the big plain. And this is why we people had to migrate to another part of the world. And this part of the world becomes ice. And the other parts of the world that are are currently under ice, thaw, and new life begins. So it makes you wonder if that is exactly what has happened in the past and the resets that we call and the mud floods and the and the deluge happens every so often. And I'm sure if, if a scientist goes to Antarctica and gets ice core samples, you might be able to predict when the next one happens according to time. Chan Thomas. That's exactly how you determine when the next one happens. Yes hundreds of thousands of years of ice cores that show and can predict or show what the future was like or the past was like. So, um, yeah, that's interesting stuff. Um, let's see. I'm just going through the questions again to see if there's anything more uh, that we haven't touched on. Uh, I see some of them here. Yeah. Uh, the reason, uh, what is this? 
Well, these are the people start stating the, they're stating. That's why we like to see the questions in capitals because um, it's easier to sort of pick them out and, and pick out the questions. People make comments in the in the chat. And by the way, while while we're talking about the chat here, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, there is the Veritas uh, link there if you want to copy and paste it, if you want to look at what Veritas is all about. The, uh, just on, on the Veritas thing, uh, uh, Mel, is there, are there uh, little samples that they can go and look at and what Veritas is about that uh, you can share with today that we can uh, direct people to? Of course, of course, they can go to the website and they can listen to a, you know, a preview of every show. It's about 20, 30 minutes long, each one of them. They can go all the way back to 2008. And now we also have a blog. I write articles almost on a daily basis. I Years ago, I used to have a, a blog that was managed by Google. And I got so tired because every so often they would delete, 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 warn me, give me strikes. And I stopped for years. But I found a way to create my own a uh, way of, of, cause I don't have more than two hours a week to, to c conduct an interview. I do a lot of research. I spend days reading books, doing analysis for each interview. When, when I'm doing an interview, I spend days diving into that guest. So this is why I don't do more than one show a week, but I, I write, I write all the time. And if I have a thought that comes to mind now, I'm able to write that down and release it uh, on the blog. And, you know, I'm, getting a lot of positive feedback about some of the stories that I've been covering uh, lately. But uh, I see some people asking questions. Do, do, I, do I know Anthony Sanchez? I do. He's a great researcher. I, I, I did an MC for an event in Sacramento many years ago. Um, paradigm shifts are the great gateway to awareness indeed. I'm just reading some of them. If you want to read some of them, yeah. Mark as well. Go ahead. My glasses, and I can't see it because it's so small on my screen that I, I'm having a hell of a time seeing it. Let's see, Mel, I like your explanation that the aliens are interdimensional and living under Earth, underground, or under oceans. Well, when you think about it, we have a very minuscule way of seeing, hearing, and feeling. And what Tesla said, if you want the secret, do not the secrets of the universe, think in terms of frequency and vibration. And I remember Grant Cameron was the one who brought that to my attention many, many years ago. And now I'm a true believer on that. That's why all the music that I prepare for the show is on 432 hertz. Um, I see the difference. I, I listen to a lot of the solfeggio music, and I think that is great for your health. If you haven't looked into it, look into it, solfeggio music. But, you know, we need infrared glasses to see. When I go to the East City Ranch, for example, I see the, the number of, of UFOs there all the time. And uh, same thing with other people. But Cliff High, you might remember Cliff High, he's, he's no longer coming to yep. Veritas. He, he, he just does not want to come to our, our platform because we're subscriber-based. So I'm sorry uh, to report that to people. But anyway, years ago, his father was in Vietnam. He was a helicopter uh, machine, uh, machine gun uh, person. Anyway, at the time in the 19, in late 1960s, the military had these infrared goggles that were red. You've seen the ones now are green, right? But they were red. Apparently with that technology back then, they were seeing spirits. They were seeing all these beings and it drew some of these soldiers almost crazy that the military had to retrieve all those red glasses and change it to a more subtle technology that has the green one. So if anybody has those red glasses anywhere, apparently you can see what's happening in multiple dimensions. Again, if you told me that years ago, I would think that you're crazy. But right now, I know that there are parallel universes that look at the Mandela effect. I used to think this was just this is just crazy. But there are so many things that I see these days, like the word normalcy. When did you ever use that word growing up, Mark? Maybe you did. I remember <laughs> normality, but never normalcy. And like that, so many things. Even my wife was telling me the other day, oh, I remember 10 years ago when I became vegetarian for a year. And I looked at her and I said, I don't remember you ever being vegetarian or friends of mine sharing something from two years ago that I never heard before. It makes you wonder, are we yeah. waking up in somebody's life in a different parallel dimension that's merging with ours? There's so many questions to explore. This is why I love what I, what oh, I yeah. do. Um, you know, I, I guess, Mel, because we're, 
we're already at uh, an hour and a half here. And one of the one of the things I wanted to get on to was Sanitas. And I'm sorry to jump around, but Sanitas mm -hmm. was a fantastic part of who you were and what it was. Um, it, are there um, videos on your website? I think you have Sanitas as a tab uh, on your website. So are there videos that, I mean, my, my mother and father always said to me, if you don't have your health, you don't really have anything. So Hi. when you start looking at um, the interviews you've done on the Sanitas side of things, uh, one of them that was just absolutely remarkable was um, uh, Dr. Campbell. No, uh, oh, well, how have I forgot his name? Uh, one second, I wrote it down here. In a, um, Johnson, the sugar one, you say? Johnson, yes, Dr. Johnson. Yeah, so... It just taught me all about sugar, like a 40 year uh, study on sugar and how disastrous it is for human beings. And the the example he used was um, they went to an the Americans used one of the islands that was just totally uh, a virgin island with uh, in, 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 intuitive in, into it uh, people living on that island. And all they ate were the stuff they fished out of the sea and coconuts and different things. And they were the healthiest people in the world. And within 10 years, they were the fattest people on the con on, the, on in the world because their systems weren't used to being introduced to Coca-Cola and these kind of products that were full of, of sugar. I was absolutely astounded how he covered the bases on sugar. Uh, sadly, I still drink the odd soft drink because... You know, I like I don't drink a lot of them. I used to drink them like two, three a day, and now I drink maybe one every two weeks. So, but that Sanitas was an amazing program. What what uh, what guests that you had on there that you would point your finger at that people when they become a member to go look at in on the on the Sanitas tab? Let me tell you a story of why I'm so invested into health because you said it right. You are responsible for your own health. You are your own advocate. Let me just give you some background as to what happened. This is mid-19, uh, let's see, uh, what was this? Early 1990s. All of a sudden, I look at my hands and there were, there were just shaking. I was getting symptoms of Parkinson's. I was having headaches all the time. I was weak. So I went to a dermatologist for something totally unrelated. And then I see that she had a, a health certificate. Uh, alternative health certificate on her wall. And I decided to ask her the question, hey, doctor, I'm having these symptoms that are unrelated to skin, but look at my hands. And she looked at me, how old are you? At the time I was 23. And she said, you should not be shaking like that. And how, how else are you feeling? Well, I feel so weak. And she started looking, do you have anybody in your family with MS? Like, no, well, that sounds like you're having that too. And a bunch of other things. So she said, she asked me, tell me what you eat and what you drink. And I said, I drink a gallon of Diet Pepsi every single day. And I eat Chinese food every single day. And she, and she laughed twice. And I said, why are you laughing? She goes, okay, aspartame and sweet and monosodium glutamate. And I said, what's that? That's how ignorant I was during that time. And she yeah. said, if you want to live 10 more years and you don't want to get Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, MS, and a bunch of other things, Stop this immediately. Come back to me in 10 days if your symptoms persist. I immediately stopped. I think that, that that doctor saved my life. But the question I had in my mind was, if I hadn't found a doctor with a conscience to tell me these things, I would be dead by now, number one. So I said to myself, one day I want to be able to tell the world. This is why when that lady said, inform the world, and I started with the UFOs, I said, there's something that's incomplete with me. And that's when I found Dr. Betty Martini and Gwen Olson and uh, Dr. Sherry Tenpenny. Those were my three first heroes. And I interviewed them. And I th those three interviews changed my life and their life. And Dr. Betty Martini recently passed away. Dr. Tenpenny, her license was revoked a few months ago, I believe, because of her stand on the stinger. And then it just progressed. Three seasons, over 150 shows. One doctor comes to mind, an Indian doctor who was trained in the United States. And I said, wait a minute, you train in the United States. A lot of times the Indian people who come to the United States stay in the United States because, you know, you can make more money than if you go to India. And he goes, that's exactly right. But when I came to the United States after I graduated, I realized when I started practicing that I could not, and I can't use this word here, I'm not a doctor, 
C-U-R-E. I can't do that. So I had to go back to my own country. So what I do now, I travel every night and then I go to villages every single day to C-U-R-E people of every disease known to man. He says, I have a book in my mind. And he said to me, if I ever put, the, put it down in writing, I'll send you a copy. So thankfully he's still alive. So he hasn't sent me a copy of the book, but that was a wonderful interview with this doctor that goes out at night to cure people in India, all over the place. And like that, there's so many interviews. Rick Simpson, uh, who's disappeared by now, Anne Baroque, who survived and cured herself of MS, who loved life. And then uh, about a year after we did the interview, she allegedly hanged herself in her garage. And if you know statistics, you know that women usually don't do that. Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez, after our interview, he was the, I'll say it now publicly because he's, he's since passed, but he was the doctor who kept Suzanne Summers alive for decades. He discovered the cure of C and many other things. He was in his office, fell and died like that. He was completely healthy. And like that, I can tell you so many other people that I've interviewed that shortly after mysteriously died. And the reason why this does not exist anymore is because some of those threats made it very close to me. And I was essentially told that you could continue talking about health as long as you do it on Veritas because you have a multiplicity of subjects like UFOs. So people are not going to believe a lot of this health stuff. But you cannot have it. You can't have any new material on the other side. I thought about reviving it, and I might because I'm tired of the threats. I mean, if you live in a free world, I don't want to be living on my knees. I want to stand up and die standing up if I have to. So that's a little bit of a, of a background on Sanitas. It's a wonderful 150 episodes that I guarantee you it will change your life. If those three episodes changed my life. When I heard the interview about magnesium, magnesium changed my life. Uh, what else? Pure organic sulfur. There's so many interviews that when you listen to them, you realize how much we don't know and where your doctor will never tell you because those, doc those doctors only have about 30 minutes of health and they don't, let's not blame them. I'm not going to blame doctors. It's just that it's not, it's not part of the Rockefeller script. It's not part of their toolbox. And you have to do this on your own. So if you want to improve your life, take a look at some of those shows. If anybody subscribes to Veritas for a year, you get free access to Sanitas as well. Uh, grounding also is another incredible oh, yeah. thing. That, uh, uh, amazing. Um, Let me tell you about grounding. Can I tell you something about grounding? Again, I'm a, I'm a skeptic by nature. Not that I'm a skeptic. I'm an open-minded skeptic. But uh, so many people were sending me emails for years about grounding. Oh, man, you need to try grounding. And I'm thinking, sure, I'll hug a tree tomorrow. Anyway, I finally decided to interview Clint Ober. Uh, and I said, yeah, Clint, I'd like to interview you. And he says, well, I don't want you to interview me unless you have tried grounding. So give me your address. I'll send you a package. And I was expecting a small box. All of a sudden, the day before, uh, weeks before the interview, I get this massive box. UPS <laughs> dropped this box in my office. I opened it, and it had every single thing, uh, pillowcases, king-size bed sheets, grounding mats, uh, wrist, you name it. So I left the box there. I ignored it. The day before, I said, oh, my God, I need to try this. So I put it on my bed. I put it on the ground, and I slept grounded. And at the time, I was suffering from sciatica. If anybody knows what sciatica is, it's, it's really a debilitating uh, problem. I had problems with my knee from skiing and uh, my right elbow from, from tennis. So I had pain all over the place, but I was ignoring it. When I wake up in the morning after that night of sleeping grounded, you know, when, when you don't have any pain, you don't think about it anymore. So when I entered the studio in the cabin, I realized I don't have pain anymore. So when you listen to my first interview with Clint Ober, I told him, and I did an interview with him a few weeks ago where I apologized to him publicly. And I said, Clint, when you sent me that box, I ignored it for weeks. And it wasn't until the day before that I tried it. And I'm so sold. And every, every person in my family that has grounded now laughed at me first, and now they cannot live without it. And this is the simplest, least expensive thing that you can use to improve your life. Because most disease is inflammation. 
every itis, pancreatitis, encephalitis, uh, dermatitis is inflammation of your skin, of your brain, of your pancreas, your liver. When you brown, all that inflammation just goes away. And why? Because in the 1960s, DuPont came with this wonderful idea of putting rubber shoe soles. When in the past, it was all leather. We were connected right. to the ground. And ever since yeah. plastic came along, disease has skyrocketed. Cancer, heart disease, you name it, all because we're not touching our wonderful Mother Earth. So if you don't have any grounding mats, all you can do is go outside your patio if you have one or the beach. Just put your feet there for 50 minutes and you'll reset yourself for days. It's almost like you're charging a cell phone. Your battery will be completely full. I can't tell you enough about ground. I could talk to you for two more hours about grounding. So I want to I want to bring up something that I've just recently discovered and I tried myself. So I've never smoked a cigarette in my life. I've never drank a drink. I've had a sip of champagne after I won the Briar in Canada, which is a curling championship. But uh, I uh, also uh, don't use drugs. I've uh, never used drugs, never done any kind of hard drugs, like other than, let's say, Tylenol or something like that, which is obviously not good for you. Um, but anyways, recently I've been introduced to this Dr. Artis. And Dr. Artis talks about nicotine. And I, I was absolutely, like, I, I can, I relate nicotine to cigarettes. And I, I implore people to look up Dr. A-R-D-I-S show. And he talks about nicotine. Uh, I'm not a doctor. I'm not trying to give you advice. I'm going to only tell you about my circumstances. He says, try nicotine patches, a seven milligram for seven days, and then see how we, how you feel. Well, I, I was apprehensive to start. Um, although I decided one day that, I, you know, what if I have some effects where I get light edit or something, I'll back off it. So, okay, I get at it. So the first day I put this patch on at 10 o'clock in the morning. And um, I'll, I'll go through the day. I don't really feel anything. And then I overnight with a patch on and I wake up and I sit on the side of my bed and I go, oh my God, I have totally no brain fog. Like so noticeable, I just was flabbergasted how clear my head was. I also had during the next six days, my diet was greatly diminished. Like I didn't have cravings for food like I had before. And I was stunned by it. I've given other people this advice to go and watch this stuff and they've tried it. Uh, some people are having some side effects from vaccination issues that he had problems with. He's having the uh, some problems with uh, his muscle retention and uh, functioning. And he actually went on it and he was amazed at how his existing medicine actually enhanced when he tried this thing with uh, with nicotine. And again, I'm not a doctor. I'm just I'm just relaying what I had with the experience I had in friends that have told me what experience I had. I would say, look it up and have a look at it. It's quite remarkable because what I thought was uh, nicotine was related to cigarettes. And what he talks about is that every cell has a nicotine receptor. And when you get some poisons in your, they go into these receptors and that transmits to the brain. Nicotine will bump it out of the receptors, and that's what he had discussed. With us. So, in short, but anyways, because we're we're short of time, and I want to no, hold it. If I may, because this is important. I love Dr. Artis, and he's on the list for this year. By the way, he's going to be on this show this year sometime. Oh, fantastic! Love Dr. Artis, especially during COVID. If you listen to a lot of the things he said during COVID, uh -huh. it was almost like uh, snake poison. Snake poison, yeah. what they had in the in the stinger. But yeah. the one thing the about King Cobra uh, I, and one other one King in Cobra, China is exactly. very rare. But what you're saying about nicotine, I want to try it. I've never tried it. But he did say a few things about nicotine. Remember what happened in 2020, I believe it was. In the United States, the legal age for smoking was 18. All of a sudden, when COVID started, started they changed it to 21. Why? And according to Dr. Arnest, people who smoke did not get, or the majority of the people who smoke, and I know many of them, all people in their 70s and 80s who've always smoked, never gotten sick, never got, everybody in their family got uh, COVID except them. And the common wow. denominator is that they all smoked. So there's something to this, and I'm going to look into it, a nicotine patch. The problem with, with cigarettes, it's not the nicotine, it's all the tar and the chemicals and the cancer carcinogens included there. Oh, something else I wanted to mention cholesterol, the biggest hoax in the world. If you listen to my interviews about cholesterol, I used to take red yeast rice. 
just because I didn't want to use Lipitor because, you know, my family, we all have high cholesterol. But then I found out that in the 1980s, 300 was considered normal. Now, if you have 200, that's high. 80% of the population is on a cholesterol-lowering medication. And according to Gwen Olson, what is Lipitor? What it does it do? It, atro it, it, it atrophies your, your, your muscles. What's your heart? A muscle. What's your kidney? Muscles. So the people who are taking Lipitor, my mother was taking that for almost 20 years. And I told her, you need to stop this. Now, of course, you know, you're never a prophet at home. But anyway, she got a letter from the FDA, the FDA saying, oh, you need to stop taking this because it's known to cause heart problems. And that's when she stopped. And she says, I've never felt better. So there you have it. Um, in, in the, and so Mel, in the, uh, in the chat, um, Michelle has just posted uh, a, a link that uh, leads to Jason Shukra uh, and something called The Antidote, um, which I highly recommend people watch and get, form their own opinions from. Um, that's in our, in the chat, copy and paste that somewhere but when we shut off that those will disappear so ask the people in our in our chat to actually uh, to look at them it's uh the uh t h e d r a r d i s h o w dot com that's on the site and it's the jason shukra interview called the antidote so that's by the way that's some, that someone asked if i know dr michael sala do i know my dr michael sala I, I think I've interviewed him all over maybe 10, 15 times. And his new wow. interview comes out, what is it today, Wednesday? Or with, no, the, today's Tuesday. It's coming out Thursday this week. Incredible part two interview of uh, the latest program we did a few months ago. The new one is just incredible. You know, you know, it's Mel, we've talked about it. We're at we have 50, about 50, you know, 18 minutes left right now. And um, when I start thinking how we've bounced around, and I apologize to people, uh, we're, Mel, you and I are both very passionate about what we believe in and what we think. We wish we could just download to everybody the things that we've heard from other people. And, you know, people have to arrive at their own decisions and be discerning and, uh, and that sort of thing. But there's so many things that we're so passionate about that – you just started getting onto these topics and the health one is such an incredibly important one. Oh my goodness. It's just, it's just so much, uh, so important. So I have had some friends recently stage four cancer uh, pass away within one month of, of getting uh, cancer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, I want, there's some other things I wish I could come out and say, and I can't right now because the people that talk to me are doctors and they told me not, they, they don't want to be related to the, to the issue. But so there are so many ways that we can get better on, on what we do on this earth. And there's gotta be, there has to be a way for us to be able to deliver messages of the truth. And you've been doing it on Veritas. And that's why I wanted to interview you, get you involved with this. So you can say the things that you, that you want to do uh, in this, in this sort of, uh, uh a platform that we have, um, which now is 10 years, and I'm excited to even be associated with it. And we have a great community here, by the way, Mel. Some great, great people always show up here and, and say the things they want to do. Um, there's one another question here before. I want, um, by the Mel, way, do you want to scroll we, down? I, I'll scroll down for a second, but I want to say something because you and I are addicted to truth. You and I don't have addictions. We don't use drugs. We don't drink. I don't drink. I don't use drugs. I, the only addiction I have is because it's, it's the truth. I have this yes. insatiable appetite for truth and finding our true, why are we here? Where do we come from? What is the purpose right. of this? Do we live in a cage? I truly believe, whether you believe in the flat earth or not, I believe there's unexplored areas of this planet with beings that are have been here before us. Um, but one thing that I've introduced, again, I used to do it many, many years ago, is you have transcripts for all, every program. But with the advent of technology, I'm now offering transcripts with a twist. If you look at our website, the newest interview that this season, all the transcripts are there, but they have highlights. They have special areas. It almost, it takes the best of every show and it consolidates it in ways where it extracts the best of the best of each one. So if you don't want to listen to two hours of interviews, you can listen, you can watch the read those transcripts and it takes you you know, what positive, what's the positive area of the show? What's the negative one? What are the questions made? What are the highlights? What are the summaries? Anybody, that's a great benefit for all the new 
Veritas Plus people. Fantastic. Sounds like a great idea, Mel. Because a lot of people don't have two hours every week to sit down and do something. I, I happen to do that, but um, others don't. So that's that's fantastic. Um, so where do we go from here? You know, I have one 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 other thing I want to make sure that I, I mentioned here about Veritas. Um, and you, in your talk about truths, but you have the ten pillars of truth seekers. It's on your website. That's easily accessible. People should go read those. Those are are all very interesting. Um, but the one area that uh, I've had that my wife always talks to me about and that wanted me to sort of jump on this thing. These are, um, so Mel, you're you're in a very unique uh, position after spending 16 years interviewing some of the most interesting people, connected, uh, uh, interesting, connected, intelligent beings. I'd like to hear your opinion on the primordial questions because I know you've, You've touched on this in other places, but I'd, I'd like to share it tonight. So if you could, like, so where do you think we're from? Where do you think, uh, let, let's start, let's start, let's start with that. Where do you think we're from, from your position? Well, the, 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 that is one of those questions that we'll never be able to get an answer, right? We can only speculate here. But again, I don't like to use the word extraterrestrial. I mean, even with religion, I, as I mentioned, I grew up an altar boy, uh, I got Cat Roman Catholic, altar boy. And I was not satisfied with the answers I was getting. And even I had my own questions thinking, you know, you have all these people that you want to have interviewed who have been abducted and they tell you their truth. Do I know if that's true or not? I don't. But I'm also yeah. not going to deny what they're telling me. Never will I have somebody coming to this program where I'm going to debunk them unless it's so blatantly obvious that they're doing it for other reasons. But right. take religion, for example. You had the Virgin Mary who all of a sudden becomes pregnant without, you know, official or natural fertilization and then gives birth to this superhuman man who does miracles. But it makes you wonder. Take a look at some of the, the people that I've interviewed. Kim Carlson, for example. She was yeah. the creator of Baywatch. And she got abducted at that time. And she's met her own offspring on ships. Do I believe her? Well, I've met her many, many times. I look at her in the eye and I never feel like she's lying to me. So people like her who are young, got pregnant. Imagine if you're, if you're married, I mean, let alone single and young. Well, well, Virgin Mary was 14, I believe. But imagine if you're married and this has happened to males and females that I've interviewed and they come back and she's pregnant and says, you know what? I'm pregnant. And they find out that the DNA is not from the husband. The husband divorces her. They do DNA and the DNA is totally different. I, I There's a story in Puerto Rico and I saw the video of the girl and she almost looks like a gray alien. And they have they had a video with an old cell phone off the ship that came to visit them. You see these stories all the time and it makes you wonder if religion, what we see as Christianity and the Three Kings were in fact an alien hybrid. Why at what? If Jesus was an alien hybrid, if you are to believe the Jesus story, some people say that that's not even true. You know, I believe in God. I believe that we don't come from a big bang. To me, that's ridiculous. Almost like throwing a, a piece of chalkboard into into a, 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 a board in a classroom and expecting the world to turn or, you know, a book come out and all the miracles of the people and the beauty of nature. So, Yes. Why do you why do you think we're here, Mel? Why? What, what's 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 the what's the meaning of of this life that we are in this this experience? I think we all have a purpose. We all have a purpose. I had this this, this discussion with Dolores Cannon many many times, and I said, Dolores, I don't believe that there's a soul contract. You're going to tell me that a child comes in to be five years old to be killed in a brutal manner. How is that something that that child asked for before he or she was born? And she said, well, some people want to come and experience life for five years or as a horse or as a fish or as whatever. Some people say, no, no, only humans have souls. And it was Garnet Schulhauser, a countryman of yours, who yes. said to me, I used to have a dog. He, I'd never forget the story. And he said, I used to come home and the dog was, you know, ready to jump on me. I would say, just get away. I'm tired. And, and then the dog died and he felt like the dog felt 
I felt so guilty, he said. Now I bought a dog, and every time I see the dog, and you look at them in the eye, and when you know that you have a soul. Guess what? There are people that you look at them in the eye, and they don't have a soul. There are plenty of those NPCs, non-playable characters, that are walking around us all the time, and you know who they are. So why are we here? We have a purpose. Your purpose and mine are different, but we all have a purpose, and sometimes it takes decades even perhaps even before we leave this plane for us to realize why we're here. That is the question. You always want to find your purpose. And when you do, make it, make a, a vacation of your vocation. So if you find something that you can do for a living and you're happy with it, even if you don't become a billionaire, Jay Whitener told me that story. He and his best friend were having a chat when they were teenagers. And the best friend said, I want to become a billionaire. And Jay Whitener says, I want to be happy. Well, the friend became a billionaire, but he's been divorced six times. None of his children talk to him. And Jay is happy. So find your purpose and go with it. And where are we headed, Mel? Like, we, 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 I, I would say that I threw out a lot of fear tonight on issues and stuff like that, where I prefer to deal in love and caring and, and I like to treat people like I like to be treated. But what are your thoughts on where we're going? Like, do you see us in space? Are we already in space? Do you, what are your thoughts on that? Before I answer that question, what you said about treating people the way they want to be treated, I learned when I lived in Asia a saying, it's not treating people the way they want to be, the way you want to be treated. You treat people the way they want to be treated. So we have to learn from other people. And I always tell people, travel. If you want to invest in something that you can take with you when you leave this plane, travel. Uh, where are we going now? First of all, we're not injecting fear. We don't want to be meditating our problems away. We're spreading awareness. And the one thing I would like to tell people is stop being the victim of fear. Fear is just an illusion. Danger is real. But when the governments of the world and people tell you all the time that the world is ending. Don't buy it for a minute. Be prepared. I'm not saying don't prepare them. I'm not saying don't buy food. Don't buy things that you might need in the future. Don't, you know, have a bug out bag. Have all those things. But live your life every single day. You never know when you're going to be called. I remember this wonderful doctor, the former medical, chief medical doctor from Finland, Dr. Rauni Kilde from Finland. You remember her. She died, they killed her. And she used to tell me, there's no death. It's like we are in a car, our bodies are the vehicle, and we just change to another car. So if you live your life thinking, we're not going to die, we might come back again here or to another world, you lose that fear of dying, and most of the other fears and phobias go away. But, uh, you know, just remember, Dr. Rani killed it. She sent me the manuscript of her book to, be, to, to publish it. Um, they try to kill her. I mean, one time she was at home with laser weapons. They burned a minuscule laser, burned her eyeglass. It was supposed to go in her brain and the eyeglasses fell on the floor with smoke. But they eventually got to her. They gave her cancer and uh, she died. But you know, like people like that happens all the time. Those be heroes of ours. So if you are awake, not woke, awake, that's what you want you to be, awake, and without fear, and take control of your own life. Stop depending on a savior. No one is going to be saving you. You are going to be saving yourself. Even when you are on a plane and the captain says, hey, the pressure has gone down. You need to grab the, the oxygen mask. You don't go and try to put people's masks on. You do it first. Take care of yourself before you take care of others. So where do we go? Are we in space? You know, Mark, I don't know. Do I believe the Apollo mission, I do not. Maybe they had different technology to go to the moon and elsewhere. Perhaps, I'm not aware of it. But I see these rockets from Elon Musk that go all the way up there. Uh, most of them go and they turn in what they call the Bermuda Triangle. That's usually where those rockets seem to be going. I never see something going beyond that. But if you see a lot of these rockets, they go up and it almost looks like it's water. Something is up there in the sky beyond what some people call the dome. And you see it's almost like there's a boat and there's water coming, coming around. 
And it was uh, Dr. August Picard in the late 1800s or early 1900s who did an experiment with a balloon. He wanted to actually see the earth and he went up there and went above what he calls the firmament. And it was almost like a, a body of water. Same thing happened with a journalist many, many years ago who went to the area where the Titanic was. And around that area, he found what looked to be a lake. And with the submarine, he tried to penetrate that area. And the submarine kept bouncing. Not even a month later, his helicopter crashed. And everybody forgot about that story. So mm -hmm. where do we go from here? What space? I don't know. You and I need to do that experiment ourselves, get a rocket to the moon and do Earth TV, and then I can give you an answer. But for now, I remain skeptical about many things. Yeah, I hear you. Well, Mel, um, let's, maybe we should try and look at the last questions here. If we're, what Is do you know? about the Skywalker Ranch? Oh, Skywalker Ranch. Skywalker I'm not too Ranch. familiar with that. I've, I've, I've read all the stories. That's an area that I would love to go. There's a new owner that I'd love to interview. So many stories. George Stamp has done great reporting on the Skinwalker Ranch. The only ranch I know, it's the East City Ranch. And that's where I had my first UFO experience, which I did not film. Thankfully, somebody else did. But just to tell you, just similar to what happens in the Skinwalker Ranch, I arrived at the East City Ranch in Washington one night. And then all of a sudden, about 2 o'clock in the morning, the whole area was shaking like an earthquake. And I just jumped out of my room. I went outside and there was a Chinook helicopter, probably about two, 300 feet above us with red, and again, those red goggles that I was telling you about, red goggles and something pointing at us. And the question is, why was a military helicopter hovering above us? Just like what happens in Phoenix in the UFO Congress. I'm told that when the X-ray machines started happening during that time, 2012, I think it was, that they really were paying attention to all the people that were arriving in Phoenix during those times for the interviews. They're looking for people. They're looking for that signature. And this is why we see a lot of uh, purple lights. People in Miami are reporting them and many other places. They're almost like infrared. They're trying to look for people who are not vaxxed. And some other people are going to cemeteries with their cell phones registering IP addresses. IP address, Mac address, pardon me, MAC addresses and cemeteries, almost like what the people are getting injected with is a MAC address. And also don't forget that Bill Gates, the moment you hybridize uh, wheat, seeds, is no longer, it's no longer your possession. Now they own the patent. So those people who have gotten the vax, now you're a synthetic individual. I hate to say it because I have even family members who didn't listen to me. You're a synthetic individual now. So they can actually have a subscription model for your health where you're going to need, I don't want to get, I don't want to depress people, but what they really wanted was to hijack your immune system so that for even a cold, you need to use big pharma in order to survive. They don't want people. There are two, the most expensive words for the establishment are two, peace and health. We have a, that's one of the reasons why I never did any drugs at all. I, I was... I have a natural immune system. Uh, we were taught that at a young age, and I, I'm 66 years old right now. I've been very rarely sick in my entire lifetime. Um, how we got away from allowing our healthy immune systems to function properly and thinking that we need big pharma on our side is is something that, um, well, let, let's talk for one second on this because this is sort of an interesting little finishing up spot, but um, mind control. So um, let me give you some proof of mind control because people say, I, I don't believe in that. You know, uh, but so Coca-Cola comes up with an idea to sell Coke and they create a brand by advertising. What is advertising? Repetitive messaging that triggers you to actually think about buying Coca-Cola when you're out in the store. That's a form of mind control. So advertising is a form of mind control. So that's a simple, simple version. But uh, Mel, what are your thoughts on on mind control? Because I think it's one of the biggest problems we have right now. I love it, Mark. You keep you keep saying things that I wanted to say, but it it didn't register. And I'm glad you're mentioning them. Everybody knows who uh, Edward Bernays, who was the the father of psychoanalysis. Uh, what's the name of the father of psychoanalysis? Anyway. 
He was a pedophile. He was mistreated by his family. His nephew was Edward Bernays, the father of modern propaganda. And if you know about propaganda, even not even decades ago, in movie theaters, they were using, you know, French fries or Coca-Cola or McDonald's. They were inserting a couple of slides here and there, and people were being subliminally hypnotized to go into the 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 concession to buy food. And they finally found that out. They they considered that to be illegal. But Edward Bernays' great nephew is Mark Bernays Randolph, the founder of Netflix. You talk about mind control. And you see movies like, I don't, I don't like to watch Netflix movies, but if I do is because I want to see, I want to decode them. And there's a movie out there called Leave the World Behind. They have so many subliminal messages. And in fact, one of our good people, uh, there's a viral video out there where somebody downloaded the movie and separated the audio channels. And one of the channels they found was a weapon, a low, ba low grade base. Uh, I, I, I don't know how, how to articulate what he told me, but it's when you listen to it, it's almost like you get depressed. And if you watch that movie, it's so depressing. And then there's a new movie coming out soon. Let's call that a sequel to this called Civil War. So they're preparing you. It's all mind control. Don't fall for it. Television, tell live vision. It's why do they call it welcome to, to the, the, the programming? They call it programming or a medical practice because doctors practice with you. All these words are being used against you and you need to be able to snap out of it. But mind control yes. is very real, very real. All you have to do is just watch a single, you know, in the six o'clock news, they tell you good evening, but less than 30 seconds later, they tell you how it's not a good evening. And you just cannot internalize all that stuff because they want you sick, tired, and in fear. It's an amazing place. Just I'm just trying to uh, bring something to the forefront here, uh, Mel. Um, one of the other things that people are not aware of, which was a miraculous thing in Canada, not only were the truckers an amazing group yes. of people and changed a lot of people's perception in this world, but... Um, they uh, they did some things and, and launched a lot of people's thought process into thinking different ways. Um, in Canada, we've just had the national. Um, oh, I'm just trying to get back. I'm just trying to get back onto our onto our page here. Hold on a second. Uh, come on. And in Berlin too, if you look, if you see what's happening in Berlin, they paralyze the entire city of Berlin in I Germany. Heard. So, in Canada, we've just finished, and there's been a final report on the National Citizens Inquiry. I'm not sure if you've ever even heard of it, Mel. This is a group of uh, citizens, intelligent people. They put together, there were five of them. They went across the country. They they interviewed 300 people. I'm talking scientists, doctors, uh, people that had been harmed by the vaccination. They went over what's happened in the last three years, actually. And they had some incredible witnesses. I'm talking mind-blowing testimony. And our, obviously our media did not carry anything with it. So I've copy and pasted it into the bottom of our chat if you want to go look at it for people. And there is testimony recorded from every single one of them. There's, uh, it's, it's transcribed as well in a PDF format, every single person that did it. It is the tell-all of tell-all. The truthers of truthers are in this, uh, the National Citizens Inquiry. I wanted to give them a plug because they did so much to wake up so many people and were allowed people to speak openly. These were doctors and scientists that basically said what they had to say. It's something, Mel, that you should look at. I know one of the guys, the head guy, the actually chairman of that, might be an interesting interview for you at some point. But anyways, um, I digress. Um, Mel, is there anything... You, I want to respect your time. We're already at four minutes after nine, and I know, but frankly, I could go through fifteen more questions here. And I don't, I, I want to respect your time. It's been a long, long journey. You're, you're a busy, busy guy. But is there uh, anything? Sorry to interrupt, to but Richard has asked twice uh, in regards to uh, the universe and evaluation of higher states, whether we're actually really animals. Uh, okay. Yeah. Exactly. Sorry. Sorry. sorry, to sorry yeah. Let's take a look at these questions. I, I can take a few more questions if you, if you want to. I mean, again, I don't do this that often, but it's it's good for me to be able to get out there and get some of these things off my chest because I, I think if I can help one person with some of this knowledge, 
I've done my job. Yeah. What is the question again that that he had? So in the in the chat, there's a one from Richard. Um, you want me to read it? Yeah, go please. Ahead, Richard. Hi, Richard. After, hey, very nice. Thank you so much for coming on tonight. Uh, after all your exposure to so much near death experience, folks are almost all convinced the universe is ultimately rooted in living or loving light and the core of life everywhere is the evolution into higher states of light or love. On the other hand, Carlos Castaneda's teacher Don Juan suggested the universe is predatory at its root, similar to Earth's natural world of animals. I was wondering where you might stand on this after just being exposed to so many stories. I believe that we live in a 3D environment where duality exists. And we believe if we leave this plane to a maybe, and, and this is something that I'm going to refer to Samuel Chung, great interview. This individual went all the way to Southeast Asia to find a French man who was abducted and taken to another world where this individual learned so much what, of what you just mentioned, that apparently when we die, we progress, we almost graduate and we go from, you know, 3D to 4D, 5D and, and, and so on and so forth. And we keep going all the way to a point where there's absolutely no duality. I think what Castaneda via Don Juan said is that this is a predatory world, but I think that in order for us to be taught a lesson, we need to know what night is. We wouldn't know what day is if we didn't have the night. We wouldn't know what cold is if we didn't have heat. So this is a school, again, Dolores Cannon, this is the school. Why don't we learn if we come from, some people say that we have past lives and others say, no, it's not past lives. It's that we have genetic memory. I mentioned this before. I knew this individual who was a patron at my restaurant for many years and he had a heart transplant when he was in his fifties from a 20 year old. And then he told me, you know, Mel, I used to despise spicy food. I used to despise uh, R and B and rap and all that urban music. And after I got the heart, I developed this taste for spicy food this is why I come to your restaurant all the time. And all of a sudden and I hear people in a boom box and before I would just flip him the finger. Now it's like, I want to listen to it. And then I thought to myself, what if this individual had those traits before? So he called the parents and he asked, hey, by the way, can you tell me more about your child, uh, your, your son? Did he like, what, mu what music did he like? What food? Oh, he loved spicy food. He loved rap music. So maybe, just maybe, cellular memory is there for a reason. Uh, past lives. I mean, can we deny so many people that, that you know, Patrick, Dr. Patrick Flanagan, I did an interview many years ago, which I re-aired a couple of weeks ago, just because I love that story of his, where his son, Patrick Jr., when he was born, you know, Patrick used to wear a Rolex watch, a gold Rolex watch. And the little kid, two years old, would grab it and say, that's mine, that's mine. So he was older and started talking and saying, I am married to this lady in Florida. I want you to call, my name is, my name was, before I died, so-and-so. So Patrick found the name on the, on the telephone book, call the lady and say, by the way, were you married to so-and-so? Yes, and he died in the same year Patrick Jr. was born. And he said, I need you to take me to see my wife. So the kid was about seven years old. So Patrick and the wife took Patrick Jr. to Florida, knocked on the door, and he said, hi, honey. Hey, where's my stuff? And she went behind, grabbed the box, opened the box. Inside of the box was a gold Rolex watch oh, and started talking about all the things they used to do to the point that Patrick's parents said to themselves, we need to do something. Long story short, they moved the lady with them to California, who became like the surrogate grandmother and lived with them, you know, for the rest of their life. And it was the wife that would, to, you know, Incredible story. How how can you deny that? Yeah. Oh, wow. so I'm not sure that... if I answer Richard's question, but uh, you know, that's the best I could do. Thank you very much. By the way, is that story you just told, did you say it was in one of your interviews on your website? 
Yes, yes, and I repeated uh, the Samuel. show. It, the pat well, Samuel Chung is the other. He's the one that flew to Southeast Asia to oh. to meet this uh, French guy who retired. Uh, he lost, he got divorced, lost his 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 business after he got abducted. That's one story. Samuel Chung, you can do a search, uh, but Patrick Flanagan, that air about three weeks ago, re-aired. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Sorry, Richard, that I missed your question. That was a fantastic question, by the way. Um, is there, Mary, are, Betty, are we missing any other questions that we haven't touched on in the discussion or in the, in the, uh, um, I think we've pretty well covered most of it. There's some yeah. comments, but an, an actual question, I think we covered them all. Um, Mel, I'd, I'd, I'd like, I, I can only say that I thank you from the bottom of my heart that you're able to come and share your thoughts with us tonight. I also thank the creator for you. Uh, you have had a tremendous effect on so many people on this earth already. You're part of the change to the good and the truth. And I have to applaud you for it. I welcome you as a brother. Uh, anytime you're, I'd like to buy you dinner, any chance you come to Phoenix or I come to Tucson, I'd love to get together with you and have a chat because there's so many other things that I can't talk about on this platform uh, from the people that we've dealt with. Um, but I have to say that you are having such a tremendous effect. And this life that you're living is so important to all humans. And I got to have to congratulate you on what you've done. And um, we would hope that someday you could come back and share your thoughts again with us because there's so much more we could talk about. Um, I, I, I ask everyone in this uh, that's listening to this in one form or another to look at Veritas as an option. He has all these years in his backlog on his site that you can go listen for days on end. How many did you say, Mel, that you, how many interviews? We're in season 16. So almost yeah. a thousand interviews. Yeah. It's absolutely an incredible gift to humankind. And again, Mel, thank you very much for coming. Your last You words? have one last quick question I did miss. I'm sorry to interrupt okay. you again, uh, Mark. Kevin just wants to know who's on the right side, good side. Elazo or uh, Greer? Elizondo? Uh, yeah, Louis. Elizondo. Elizondo. Elizondo or Greer? Yeah. yeah. Dr. Greer. I'm going to plead the fifth on that. <laughs> <laughs> let me just anyway. let me just say something about that. Yes, I have, I have met Very Dr. Good. Greer in the past. Um, my only question is, he, he used to have a company for advanced technology. And I know some of the people that had some of the technology go through it, but nothing ever comes out. So the question is, the question is, if something goes in, why doesn't it come out? And when I interviewed him, he was on the way to the CIA. He's done a great job with the Closure Project. It has motivated many of us to do what we do. And some of the people that he has uh, had in the past few weeks uh, with the, the, the new Disclosure Project. They're also, you know, whistleblowers coming out with great information. That's all I can say. I'm, I'm just concerned that there's so much great technology out there. Everybody talks about, you know, wind. Wind is the worst of all, by the way. It's the most expensive, most... If you want to talk about climate change and climate destroying, wind is the worst of all. So I don't mean to digress, but there is technology out there that could take us to the Jetson years that we've been waiting since the 1960s. But obviously there are certain people who will never want to do that. I mean, in the 1800s, we have electricity everywhere. We had toilets everywhere, even in the 1700s. All of a sudden we're led to believe that we didn't get electricity until the late 1800s, early 1900s. We had electric scooters, cars, motorcycles that had 800 to 1,000 miles in one charge. And now, Look at all these vehicles in Canada and northern United States that can't even go below 28 degrees. Something happened and we have been sequestered. So our jobs is to be able to reopen this gate, this cage that we live in, to be able to remove the shackles. And that's our job here in doing what we do. Mel, again, thank you so much for your time. I'd like you to finish with 
your parting thought of what you'd like to pass on, not only to our group, but to the others that'll watch us on YouTube. I'm going to repeat um, the words from Dr. Judy Wood. Speak the truth. Doesn't matter how much it hurts. You might be unpopular. And trust me, I've lost friends and family members because I speak the truth. But if you do it from the heart, this is the legacy you're going to leave behind. Find your passion. Do it the best you can. And if you enjoy what you heard today, go to veritasradio.com. I've included interviews from day one. You can go all the way back to 2008 for that very interview, which was supposed to be just a souvenir call that became what it is today. We're in season 16. Um, I have the privilege of meeting some of the most wonderful people in the world. Mark, I'm honored that you contacted me for this because I really don't give that many interviews. I enjoy it when people that I trust interview me. I'm honored to not only call you my friend, but you're a brother in truth. And those people who are listening to us tonight, thank you so much for spending some of the time with all of us because I think that we're in here together fighting this, this fight. 2024 is going to be probably one of the most interesting and decisive years in our lifetime. And hopefully, if you want me back in the future, I hopefully we'll do it again. It'll be my pleasure. But if things don't change, I don't see a 2025. I think we're right now in a, in a place, it's a fork in the road. And people like us need to wake others up. I know some people say, don't wake others up. That's their destiny. But we have to. If you want to stand strong and stand still, you choose. That's beautiful, Mel. Thank you for everything. And again, thank the creator for creating you. You're a wonderful soul and a person of truth that people can rely on. And um, anyways, I appreciate everything about you. Anyways. Thank you. Be well. God bless. God bless to you.